Aloha. My name is John Spencer, and I'm the chair of Urban Warfare Studies at the Modern War Institute, a research center at the United States Military Academy. It's a great honor to be here with you to discuss rehabilitating cities or the use of armies in post-urban operations. I'm going to start by sh sharing my screen. So the picture you see here is in Japan in 2011 after the tsunami off the coast. You know, over 100,000 members of the Japanese Special Defense Forces were rapidly mobilized to deal with the crisis that happened after that tsunami, which had a very heavy urban component. I think it's one of the many case studies that we could use for post-disaster or post-conflict rebuilding of cities. And case studies are important. So case studies tell us what the known, unknown, and unknowable is about really any situation where we're doing rehabilitation or post-urban operations missions using our armies. And there are many case studies that we could use post-conflict or post-disaster ancient world to ongoing reconstruction or rehabilitation projects that are happening today. I like to look at Carthage because Carthage is a very famous city that was destroyed, but it was also a very famous city, which was reconstructed. It was actually Caesar after his plan, after his death was put into place and Carthage was recreated and became the jewel of, of the Roman empire again. Or you could look at World War II as a very great case studies, many case studies of what it takes to rehabilitate a city that's been damaged. Everything from Cherbourg, which is the first city that the U.S. military encountered uh, in the operations, to Paris, major city that much reconstruction and rehabilitation was done in, Berlin, all of the current disasters which unfortunately we have many of them because of the urban nature of our littoral cities and the increase of global warming from new orleans 2005 during operation hurricane trina to the tsunamis that hit the coast of indonesia in 2011 current operations in the middle east and cities that are being rebuilt after having to fight the islamic state where you talk Raqqa, Amawari in the Philippines. Um, we have many examples, I think. And these are important examples to look at how we move forward and what lessons learned we take forward with us during those operations. So armies are, of course, used in, you know, across time in rehabilitation and reconstruction projects. And here I've listed from you know, my wide view of operations how the armies are used. I mean, of course, armies are used for rapid command and control of very chaotic situations, and we provide that with all of our leadership and expertise in command and control. Those are, of course, multi-agency command centers, not saying the military will be in the lead, sometimes in a supporting or supported role, but we have the experience of standing up rapid command cells, and you'll see that across time uh, up, up until today. Search and rescue, you know, Armies can do that. Many advancements today are using dogs for search and rescue to using drones to assist in search and rescue or in communicating with civilians. Delivering and securing immediate aid, of course, is, is always an immediate need. The priorities of human life and sustaining human life, food, water, medical care. We, we've seen this across time, how armies are used for that. Um, and we have to look at our lessons learned from each one of these case studies, whichever ones we choose to see what was done right, what was done wrong, what could be done better. Um, and, and you really need a repository of this as we move forward to look at how to support better in these major operations that I highly believe will continue. Even in delivering of aid, crowd control doesn't always keep, you know, rise to our attention, but it becomes a major operation, especially in urban situations. The, the picture on the bottom right is, um, in Haiti, after the Port-au-Prince um, earthquake shook the place, if any military force was presented themselves with aid, they were mobbed just because the, the people were in such need. Um, but it became a major operation to, to, to show soldiers and to plan how to deliver aid while still keeping in mind about this basically crowds that will form immediately. 
Security, it's always a concern. And militaries across time have been used immediately after either post-conflict, post-disaster, any, any situation while still maintaining that it is not a military op- operation per se. It's a, it's a different phase of military operation. But the you know, security is a very high concern. And there are some organizations across time that use the disaster for their benefit. So de- you know, just deterring looters immediately after some an event in major urban areas is, is a major operation that has to be planned with good doctrine on what's going to be told to the soldiers. Um, something that we sometimes don't think about is to preventing black markets. As we know, disasters and economic, um, even economic disasters cause this black market to populate and how the military is going to assist civilian leaders and keeping that to where it doesn't become a major issue. Uh, and then just collective assurance. When you see soldiers uh, you know, in armies in support of civilian agencies in these situations, it gives the community something they need, which is that assurance that everything is going to be okay. Cleanup. So the use of armies to help with cleanup, your debris and rubble clearing is always a top priority. So there's not just what resources the army can bring, but how they can control that flow of debris clearing immediately as you also have other operations happening at the exact same time you need to get debris out of an area. You have dead body care, which doesn't usually, I don't see it in lessons learned, but it's, it's a major aspect of everything from having the appropriate resources to do dead body care, but also to do it respectively in the cultural norms of that sit, that urban area. Uh, explosive ordnance disposal, it's a global shortage of personnel that can do that effectively and do it rapidly in some of these situations, especially like post-World War II. Um, the hundreds of thousands of explosive ordnance left in the urban areas as people are trying to move back into these cities. You know, none of this is new, but it just seems to doesn't get highlighted to me in the lessons learned, especially managing the flows. And I know this corresponds with understanding cities and major urban areas, but understanding flows in a post-conflict, post-disaster situation becomes a major concern for armies as they have to design the flow of the city to support the post-conflict situation. Everything from what lanes will the debris trucks take out of the city where you want the civilians coming into the city as they return immediately, which is historical to the situations. And then lastly, what we, we usually don't like to, to talk about, but it has become a major issue across time, is just assisting civilian organizations in both the governance of urban areas in these situations and the gov- establishing the government, assisting in help standing back up the governments in these, these areas. So that was a quick look, but I, I have looked you know, case study specific. So after World War II, there were major reconstruction, as everybody knows. There's actually myths about reconstruction after after World War II that often get quoted if you talk about this in different circles. So every city is different, and I think that's what we've learned, especially in recent urban studies. You look at a mega city or just a very large city, each one is different. It's there for a different reason. It was created for a different reason, and it has I has different priorities really to get the city back up to its original state. Um, And then I think number one for armies, especially if we're talking very operational level, high level armies, rebuilding cities is not rebuilding nations. And that's a big problem in this field of study is most of academic communities, most government organizations are designed to rebuild nations or to assist in nations in catastrophes, not cities. And some cities are bigger than some nations, and it's, it is different. So after World War II, they had to recognize that each city was different, that you need specialized workers to assist in urban tasks. But also every decision about rebuilding is political, and we all know that. And, and warrior scholars, we should know that. Um, and after World War II, most people say, well, yeah, you know, the, the Marshall Plan helped rebuild the European countries. And that's a myth. And it really is a big myth in, if you talk about rebuilding of cities. Um, if you look at Japan and the Soviet Union, you know, there was high-level national guidance that came from, from them um, versus you know, rebuilding of Germany cities, which is really local. Um, in all the situations, of course, resources 
it is needed to rebuild and rehabilitate everything. But it is how you funnel those resources into the different environments that becomes a major issue that has to be designed with these organizations that get stood up, which the Army is always a big part of. Um, and rebuilding the decisions on the, on the future, too. So, you know, it's, it's, again, a civilian function, but what the decisions that get made about what to rebuild and how to rebuild it have a major impact on the future of any urban area. And there are many classic examples of that in history. So in, in Warsaw, after World War II in, in Poland, Warsaw was, just, was destructed by 85% of the city was destroyed. And it was destroyed so much that they didn't remember what it used to look like. Um, and it had to be reconstructed off the 18th century painting of the city. And they, the community was very adamant that they would reconstruct what used to be rather than something new. And that becomes a major debate when you talk about what are we going to rebuild? And you, different agencies that you listen to will say, well, we need to rebuild, you know, build it better. So build bigger streets, make it more um, functional. You know, these are macro level decisions that, but armies will be involved in the amount of knowledge that we have and can help in this shared multi-agency commands does have an impact on the future of these cities. Matter of fact, scholars say that those cities that reconstructed towards historical standards, everything from street plans to historical sites, do much better than cities that were reconstructed in modernist views. So you're taking the advantage to say, okay, let's make these streets bigger. Let's redesign the, pat the street patterns. The cities that went more traditional have done much better. And that gets you to this rebuilding of the the city back to a historical and, and many of these cities again are they they are living organisms that are there for a reason i mean carthage of ancient rome was a major city for centuries for a reason of, of, of its location of its cultural importance and sometimes we we as scholars forget that when we talk advising about okay reconstruction we need to get the debris out of here we need to restart rebuilding buildings but each city is different so this is the damage caused by the Hurricane Katrina in the United States in Louisiana in 2005, the, the most destructive natural disaster in the United States history. It impacted over 93,000 square miles and left over a million people homeless, $160 billion. Um, and I think that there's a lot of lessons in it. If I had a case study portfolio for helping armies understand how to, you know, the different um, political, logistical, all the different requirements that we all want to prepare for in our planning and wargaming, um, I, I would definitely include Katrina in there. Um, over 15,000 U.S. troops were deployed to assist in all those support operations that I talked about at the beginning of the show or re presentation. So the big lessons from Operation Hurricane Katrina at the, at the very highest levels was that, you know, you needed different types of plans to rebuild cities and they, they just weren't there. Again, we're, we had this nat nation state focus. You needed different types of organizations stood up to assist cities in rebuilding and different funding. As I told you, you know, lots of resources will be, get, be given to the situations, but there's not necessarily the right type of organizational funding mechanisms to get the money to the cities. And I think one that always hits me is experts in city building after crisis. There is actually a, a global deficiency in that. Whether you go, look to ac academia, you look to the military, the amount of specialists we have in rebuilding urban areas, despite the urban nature of the world, is actually low. So in, in World War II, actually two months after World War II started, the United States stood up a school of military governance at the University of Virginia. And because they knew that, you know, this post-conflict um, assistance with countries and cities and standing back up would be a huge, huge thing. And the school was stood up. Over 450 officers were, were graduated per year to be uh, military governors of certain areas, civil affairs officers, or just advisors to commands and staffs as they did this work of recon, rehabilitation, especially of urban areas. And in the IG report really after the school started there was a lot of questions about 
Well, are you creating people that are specialized in things such as city administration, um, local you, city planning? Um, and the answer was no, we, we're not. We're focused at the national level and executive administration of experts like that. So it really begs the question is who are, who are experts in city rebuilding? Um, and there was another question about, well, do you have the people attending? Are they former city specialists? And the answer was yes. Like, like of the current year, we had a city mayor, we had some city attorneys, you know, soldiers that had these former professions, but it wasn't programmed. And, and I think this is my last slide and this, this big call out to that we need experts. You need experts in cities. You know, going back to the example of Warsaw, who knows what the city was like before this all happened and will be a part of the team advising what to reconstruct. What was it? Because a lot of times we start reconstruction or rehabilitation, we're trying to get the city back up to this weird level that it never was before, creating something new. And of course, we have military experts. We have in the United States, we have what's called civil affairs, but they're not trained in urban specific focus. Um, we have engineers, that, structural engineers, civil engineers, all these people that will be able to help. But we also have to look to the civilian organizations, just like they did in World War II to stand up the school at the University of Virginia. We all have immense resources within our populations, in our civilian organizations. But again, finding the city-specific experts. We almost need like this Rolodex of experts. So the next time a disaster happens, here are the people that we're going to assemble a part of our joint multinational teams to assist in, in these areas. And then I think lastly, the hidden factor. So just like that question to the World War II school is, well, who in your formations is not necessarily a specialist in the military function, but who is, has history? Um, everything from people that were former mayors to people that know how power works. And are, and are, are we able to identify those people quickly and to use those resources? So with that, I'll close. I think this is a very important topic and we have a lot of work to do in preparing for the future and both looking at the lessons learned and knowing who our experts are. Thank you. From all of the folks here at the Modern War Institute, we would like to thank you for watching our videos and invite you to explore our podcasts and our webpage linked below.